cannot bear here. And I'm referring to Jesus' teaching on hell. Concerning hell, C.S. Lewis once wrote, There's no doctrine that I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this if it lay in my power. I said this last time, in many ways I agree with C.S. Lewis. No one, uh, Christians included, should like the idea of hell. I certainly don't. Those of us who believe in hell and those of us who still preach and teach on the subject, we're not sadists. Uh, the thought of any person being outside of Christ going to hell for eternity, that's heartbreaking to me. And I know you feel the same way. Okay. But hell is still something that the Bible teaches. It's a difficult reality. But we cannot understand God. We cannot understand this world in which we live. We cannot understand the Christian faith. We cannot understand the future unless we grapple with it. We must deal with it. And so Jesus warned us, didn't he? With graphic terms, Jesus warned us about the reality of hell. And so I would suggest to you, in, in the most loving way that I know how, that you would read it in Scripture. That you would repeat what the Scripture has to say about it to your own soul. That you would think about hell long enough and often enough that that would keep you close to Jesus. That that would keep you humble and happy and hoping in Him and in Him alone. I would recommend to you that you would think long enough about hell and often enough about hell that it would keep your eyes fixed on heaven. And if you're doing your scripture reading through the New Testament, what you're going to find out is that over and over again, Jesus and the inspired apostles and prophets spoke about hell. Right. They spoke of it often. I was reading that in the 10 years from 2004 to 2014, Americans saw a 22% reduction in those who claimed to believe in a literal hell. And it has only gotten worse. In fact, it has gotten much, much worse in the past 10 years, as you would imagine. One of the primary drivers of this trend that people no longer believe in hell is an instinctual response that perceives it to be illogical. Hell is just not logical, they say. And hell is unnecessary. And hell is cruel. In his massive book, The Devil's Redemption, Michael McClayman chronicles Christian uh, the rejection of hell, which spans all ages of church history, dating back to just a few decades after Origen. Origen lived in the second century. But Mike Kleiman meticulously shows that this rejection of eternal hell, that it was the minority report, if not relegated to just one or two uh, more obscure groups depending on the era, that is up until the 1960s. So up until the 1960s, 2,000 years of church history, uh, all, everyone believed in an eternal furnace of fire. The condemnation of God upon the wicked and rebellious, they believed that. But beginning in 1960, the age of humanism, uh, at that time, a massive uptick in universalist thinking occurred, which he says is unprecedented in the history of the church. Let me tell you what that means. It means that though the traditional doctrine of hell uh, is clear in Scripture that it has been under fire for millennia, but only recently has it become endangered. Hell has become an endangered doctrine. Preachers don't want to preach about it anymore. Christians don't want to teach their neighbor about it anymore. We don't want to think about it anymore. It is as if though we took this doctrine of hell and put it in the pulpit to try to hide it. As if though we're ashamed of it. We're ashamed to preach about hell. We're ashamed to tell people about hell. But let me tell you something. Jesus wasn't ashamed of it. Amen. The Lord wasn't ashamed of this topic. He addressed it often. In fact, most of what Jesus taught comes down to two things. 
It's always been these two things and it forevermore will be these two things. And those two things are heaven and hell. D.A. Yeah. Right. Carson showed that hell is one of eight possible motivations for accepting the gospel. Tim Keller whittled that down to six motivations for accepting the gospel and both of those noted Bible teachers placed hell first on the list. The first thing on the list of motivations for a person to accept Christ and the gospel. Now, I, there's a lot that D.A. Carson and Tim Keller believe that I don't agree with, but I agree with both of them on this. I believe, in, I believe that hell is the greatest motivator for people to come to Christ and to obey the gospel. In fact, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18 speaks about Christ delivering us from the bondage of the fear of death. And then Hebrews 10, 31 says that uh, it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The Apostle Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Historically, the teaching of hell has played a large role in convincing people of their need for Christ. But today, the problem is we're losing the doctrine of hell. I said this when we were in our In Light of Eternity series that we're losing eternity. Have you noticed that? In this secular age in which we live, people just believe in the here and now. And that's basically because of humanism which leads ultimately to atheism. Kids go through school being taught that science somehow has disproven the Bible. It has disproven the reality of God's existence. Therefore, there is no judgment to come. There is no eternity. There is no heaven and hell. And then we wonder why we have a generation or two that is as wicked as they can be and will not hear the gospel or obey it. It's no wonder to me that this is the way that it is. We, we have lost the doctrine of hell. And Carson and Keller, they insinuate or they suggest, rightfully so, that as we are losing the doctrine of hell, we are also losing conversions with it. And if we care about the lost, folks, and I know that we all do, if we care about the lost, especially our children, our, our beloved family members, we must take care to articulate not just what we are inviting people to, but what we are inviting them away from. You know what I mean? We invite people to Christ telling them that if you'll obey the gospel, He'll give you psychological happiness. He'll give you a better marriage and a better family and maybe a better financial situation. You'll learn how to be a better steward of the things He's given you. And life will be better and your sins will be forgiven. And I believe that all that's true. All right. But we're failing to tell people that if you don't come to Christ, friend, you'll lose your soul in hell. Mm -hmm. Forevermore! The smoke of your torment going up before a holy and just God! We need to tell people and warn them that this will be the fate of the wicked. This is the fate of the damned. That place that Jesus described as outer darkness, inarticulate wailing, gnashing of teeth, a furnace of fire, the punishment of the wicked. That's what we're inviting people away from when we stand at the end of the sermon and say, come to Jesus. We're inviting them away from that. In fact, in the verse that tells us about the love of God sending His Son into the world, there's also this other side of it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, right. but have everlasting life. So today, once again, we're going to see that hell is real. Hell is eternal. It does make sense. It is logical, despite what some so-called philosophers are saying today. Now, I want to frame this up a little bit different uh, this morning for the next few minutes. I want to try to explain some things about hell in a way that even a child might understand and benefit, benefit from their uh, implications. Just recently, uh, a colleague, a co-worker, inquired about the subject of my current preaching. I work with a young girl. She's a member of the denomination. Her husband is a preacher. 
In fact, he just finished up seminary and they're trying to plant a church. So she's interested in my take on uh, what the scriptures teach. So she asked me almost every week what I'm preaching on. And so I, I responded that I was addressing the difficult subject of hell. Upon overhearing the conversation, another co-worker expressed their disapproval of that. Uh, they disapproved of this topic being preached from the pulpit, citing its frightening nature. In other words, they were saying that shouldn't be preached from the pulpit because it's too scary. And this person shared an experience when uh, many years ago a sermon on hell was preached and it deeply alarmed her young son. He was about eight years old at the time. Um, and that preaching on hell, I guess it was a hell fire damnation sermon like this one. But uh, that sermon led that young boy to persistently ask his mother and father questions about death and hell. And my co-worker expressed her concern stating, I don't want my children to fear that disobedience will result in them going to hell. Let me tell you something about childhood development, if you don't know this. We, we learned this in uh, health care. At about eight years old, that's when children begin to, to understand that death is a, something big. It's something permanent. It's a bad thing. And they, they start grappling with it. They start having questions with it. I remember when Emily was about that age, about eight, she came to my office where I was working at the time, a doctor's office down the road, and uh, some of my coworkers were standing around, and they said to Emily, they said, uh, Emily, what's up? And Emily said, she didn't say anything to preface this. She just said, George died. I was shocked. They were all shocked. They looked at me like, what's going on with your daughter? You know, but just so happens that week I preached the funeral of George Martin. And that was on Emily's mind. She said, George died. If you think your children aren't thinking about death, and they're not thinking about what comes thereafter, you are wrong. You are so wrong. And I want to turn the tables to this uh, incident that happened. And I want to say that we should be 100 times more concerned about an 8-year-old child who has no fear of death or hell than we should be about a child who does fear death and hell. Amen. One of the reasons that we may not feel this way, that it's good for our kids to fear death or hell, I mean... Uh, if our children, if they don't have any fears, we just kind of go along as if everything's well, don't we? I mean, oh, this little guy, this little guy of mine, he's so happy. He's a happy little fella. And this little gal, she's such a cheerful little girl. And when our children have anxieties or nightmares or fears, then all of our parental instincts go into gear because we want to help them, don't we? Not realizing, perhaps, that the child with no fear needs even more help from parental vigilance and concern than the child with much fear. I want to encourage you parents. I want to encourage you that the problem that you're dealing with, the problem that I'm describing is a good problem to have. I hope you have this problem. I do. If your children have fear of hell and death, then you, you are in a position, you have a golden opportunity to help them deal with it, not by hiding it, but by lovingly teaching them that Jesus Christ is the answer to hell. Amen. That's what we need to be teaching. If they're not thinking about it, there will be more reason to be concerned, I believe. So the question is, how do we help an eight-year-old child deal with the terrifying reality of death and hell? Well, I believe the main thing is to realize that God intends for our real and wise fear of hell to be a means of clarifying and establishing in our hearts some great realities. Great realities. God does not intend for His children to experience hell as an end. He, he made hell for the devil and his angels. God does not intend that any of us experience hell as an end, but to experience the warning of hell now. Right. as a means to clarify and establish in our hearts these great truths. 
So, let's talk about these great truths. These implications. Explaining hell. Some truths to frame the discussion. Number one. The fear of hell for your children, whether children or not, six or sixty, eight or eighty. The fear of hell is a golden opportunity for treating God as big and glorious and utterly real. If hell says anything, it says that. Okay. I mean, the Bible tells us that God's holiness and God's perfections are so complete that if anyone were to see God, he would die. Just read Exodus 33, verse 20. Even the slightest sin in God's presence, that tends to bring immediate death or annihilation. When Isaiah, the prophet of God, saw God sitting upon His throne high and lifted up, the Bible tells us that He fell down on His face, terrified and sure that He was about to be destroyed. Just read Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. The doctrine of hell has fallen on uh, hard times. It's fallen out of favor with many, but it's in the Bible for a reason. God put it in the Bible for a reason. Jesus gave us all these descriptions of it for a reason. God tells us about hell to demonstrate to us the magnitude of His holiness. You want to know how holy God is? Look at the place that He made for the wicked. And you'll know how big God is. You'll know how great God's just holiness is. Hell is what hell is because... The holiness of God is what it is. Right. Hell is not one degree hotter than what our sin demands that it be. Hell should make our mouths literally stand agape at the righteousness and the just holiness of God. It should make us tremble before His majesty and His grandeur. God is great. Amen. Ironically, Doing away with hell. When we do that, we do away with the very resources that show God's justice and God's holiness. I mean, how are we going to convince the world of how great God is? How are we going to convince our children of how great God is? If we hide away this teaching about hell. So the fear of hell is a golden opportunity for treating God as big and glorious and utterly real because He is. Now it's hard for human beings who are sinful to, full, to uh, feel the full reality of God. I get that. But if God is the one who created hell, and He is the one who created hell, and if God is the one who makes hell just, and He does, then this is a golden moment. The reason hell is so terrible is because God is so great that to despise God, to reject His Son, to reject the Gospel, and to live in opposition to His will, that is so great that it deserves hell. It, it, it deserves this terrible punishment. Isaiah, Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 6 says, There is none like you, O Lord, you are great, and great is your name in my Psalm 96 verse 4 says, For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. 1 Chronicles 29 verse 11 says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth. Yours is the dominion, O Lord. And you exalt yourself as head over all. Psalm 47 verse 2 says, For the Lord Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. In other words, the whore of hell is a signpost concerning the infinite worth and the preciousness and the beauty and the goodness and the justness and the holiness and the love and the mercy and the grace of God. That's right. Let me tell you something. If God were small, as our society thinks He is, in fact, they think nothing of Him. If God were small, hell would be lukewarm. If God were small, hell would be maybe a flicker. Or it would be temporary. 
But God is not small. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. He has made everything that exists and He's given us life and everything to enjoy and He has established His law. And He is good, but He is also holy and just and He is a righteous God. And because He is so big in every way, friend, you can, you can mark it down because He is great. Scorning Him is the most terrible thing that you could ever do. In fact, the greatest of all the commandments is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. Amen. You just think about the creation. The Bible tells us that the creation declares the glory of God. Mm -hmm. The firmament uh, puts on display his handiwork, and therefore the fool had said in his heart there is no God. Creation, Christ, Calvary, the church, the Bible, prayer, judgment, heaven, hell. How big are those things? Well, they're only big because of the God behind them all. Right. And we should bow on our knees <clears throat> before Him. Our hearts should melt before God. Proverbs 8.13 says, The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. If you fear the Lord for how great He is, then you cannot then help but hate the things that He hates. And you hate the things that God hates because you know that those things will result in the punishment that God said that they would result in. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance, and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. Matthew 10, 28 says, and this is the Lord speaking, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear Him, that's God, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Why should we fear our choices in life and make those choices carefully with wisdom? Why should we care about sin and its seriousness? Because of who God is what God can do. Psalm 33 verse 8 says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. 1 Peter 1.17 says, And if you call, him, uh, call on Him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, He will judge each one of us based on our works impartially. If that's the case then, Peter said, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. All of your exile. Spend it fearing Him. Amen. Because He is God. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 5.11 says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are manifest in your conscience. So the fear of the fear of hell, folks, is a golden opportunity for you to teach your kids and for you to be reminded how big and glorious God is and how utterly real God is. Here's another thing. The fear of hell is a golden opportunity to teach your children and to be reminded yourself about the nature and the exceeding great seriousness of sin. Here's another topic that's not real popular in our world today either, sin. Let me tell you something about hell. Think about this. And think about it long and hard. Hell is simply the result. It's the outcome of a life of sin. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. Therefore, your children and you need to understand what sin is. Now, the Bible defines sin very simply as the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. The Apostle Paul, Romans 3 and Romans 6, tells us that sin is falling short of the glory of God. Now God is so big and He's so glorious that we should stand in awe of Him. We should walk in fear of Him. And so to sin is to fail to see God as big. It is a failure to see the glory of God. It is a failure to honor God in our life. It's a failure to thank God as glorious and to follow God and to praise God and to obey God. That's what sin is. We need to make sure that our children see the direct connection between their sins and hell. Because sin is what puts people in hell. Right. 
In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, the Apostle Paul says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest or clearly evident, and they are these. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Paul says, I warn you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Just let that last statement soak in. Those who do these things, those who live this way, will not go to heaven. I'm not saying that. Paul said that. In James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, Paul talks about temptation. He says we're tempted when we're lured by, away by our own desires. And then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. The end of the life of sin is death. Right. Not dying physically. We all die physically. The body dies. James here is talking about the death of the soul. The eternal destruction that happens at the coming of the Lord Jesus when he comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Colossians 3, verses 5 and 6 says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, Covetousness, which is idolatry, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Do your kids know these things? The great and frightening tragedy of growing up feeling no fear for hell is that in a life like that, growing up with no fear of judgment or hell, children are not able to see sin as being serious. They're just not. How can they? We have a whole society today of people who are doing their own thing. They are reveling in sin, balling up their fist in the face of God because they do not understand. But they are sending themselves to hell unless they repent and are forgiven. A great and frightening tragedy is for our children to grow up and feel no fear of hell and to live that kind of life not being able to see sin as serious. And it just will not ever get to the point in their lives where sin is ugly and outrageous unless they understand the penalty for it. Because they haven't been schooled by us or been schooled by themselves on the penalty of sin, namely hell, they cannot see sin then as a great and horrible offense against God. But let me tell you something. Homosexuality is not a sin because it goes against the Republican Party's ideas. It is a sin because it is an affront to God. Amen. It is a sin against God's will. And all these other sins that the Apostle Paul mentions, God is the one who will avenge mm -hmm. and repay. But there's no fear of God. And if you want your kids to grow up and understand what the truth is concerning sexuality, uh, spirituality, marriage, the family, modesty, a good work ethic, and then, of course, to be prepared to stand before God in the judgment, they need to know what the cost is in defying God. Fearing hell is a golden opportunity for bringing our children into the light concerning the horrible darkness of sin. Let me give you a few situations. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to finish this today. So maybe another time we'll get all of it in. But let me just give you a few situations. I've been thinking about this, and uh, you've heard these things before. But I want to give you a few situations that you already come across where you can just stop and take a minute and teach your kids what sin is and how to handle sin and do it in the context that sin leads to an end result of hell. Okay, number one, you can teach your kids about sin and its seriousness when you sin against them. 
I've had to do this, probably most fathers here have, and mothers as well. You know what I mean, that moment when you lose it, you yell at them perhaps, you discipline them out of anger, or maybe it's not necessarily something you do to them, maybe it's just something you do. Maybe you, you've done something wrong, they know you have. Uh, the best thing you can do to teach your kids how to deal with sin in their own lives is to show them how you deal with it in your life. Let them know that you wish to make things right with God. First of all, I want to make this right with God. I believe in the judgment. I believe that my sin will jeopardize my hope of heaven. And so I want to get this taken care of with God. And I want to get it taken care of with you. And if you sin in a way that would require you to make an open and public confession, let them see you do that. Let them see in you that you believe that sin is serious and that you want to get it taken care of. You want to honor God. You fear God. Let them see that in you and that will, uh, that will transfer to them. Amen. Let them know that you're not perfect. In fact, they know already. Let them know that when you make some kind of move that puts you in jeopardy of your hope of heaven, that the right thing to do is to confess it turn from it, and to seek God's forgiveness in it. Right. That you might be forgiven. Here's another way that you can teach your kids about the seriousness of sin and how to deal with it. Do it as you interact with media. You know what I mean? Point out to your children what sin is and call it sin when you encounter it on TV or in advertisements or Facebook or other social media platforms Use that opportunity with descriptive words to help your children understand what sin, sinful behavior is. Don't call it a bad thing. Call it sin. Name it. And then show them that from the Scripture. You want to show them what God has to say about homosexuality? Open up 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and Romans chapter 1 and teach them in that context that this is an abomination unto God. It is a sin that will keep people out of heaven. Help them to understand that this is not just another lifestyle. It's not just an alternate choice for human beings. It's a moral and spiritual issue. Right. Amen. Here's another way you can teach your kids about sin and uh, the seriousness of it, how to deal with it. Do it when your kids sin. You know, there's an important difference I've learned in parenting between teaching your children to manage their emotions and uh, talking to them about sin. I remember when our kids were growing up, Emily and Nathan, I would say to them uh, something to the effect, you need to change your attitude. And what they would do is they'd put a smile on their face, you know, but I knew that the smile on their face did not reflect what they were actually thinking or feeling. And I realized after a while that I was kind of defeating the purpose. And so I, instead of saying change your attitude, I started making it more about behavior and telling them it's okay to be upset. You can even, you can even question my decisions. We'll sit down and talk about why the rules are what they are. Uh, you can feel sad. You can feel angry. You can have feelings and emotions. We all <coughs> have feelings and emotions. But what you must understand is you cannot let them lead you to bad behavior. And so instead of saying change your attitude, I would say be more respectful to your mother. Honor your mother and give them a scripture for that. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, when your kids sin, that's a good opportunity to help them see that it's the behavior that ultimately is the problem. And then as they begin to learn and grow, then their hearts can change and their emotions can come on line with their behavior. But it starts with behavior, with your children. And here's another way that you can teach your kids about the seriousness of sin and how to handle it when you encounter sinful behavior in the world, not just, uh, not just in uh, media, but in the world. Now, our children are going to see a lot of sin. There's simply no way to hide them from sin. Wendy and I are pushing our kids to uh, homeschool our grandchildren. That's what we think about the dangers now of some of the things that they experience in the public school system. That's just what I think about it. A lot of other Christians feel the same way. I'm not saying that you have to do that, but we think it might be a good idea, but you know what? Even if you homeschool them, you can't get them out of the world. 
They're still going to see a lot of sin. It's unavoidable. And what you need to do is to show them how to respond to it. Many young people, they, uh, uh, they kind of turn away from conservative values, turn away from traditional Christianity, usually to something more progressive, maybe even atheism, because they never had any solid reasons for their belief. And there are plenty of people who are more than happy to twist the scripture in your kid's mind to make them doubt what they've been taught. And this is why teaching them apologetics can help them become more familiar with some of the arguments that they'll hear and be able to answer those with confidence. And so when they encounter sin in the world, that's a golden opportunity for you to come along and help them to reason through all the false ideas that are being promoted in the world to justify sin, that is. <coughs> the fear of hell, the fear of judgment, death, and hell is a golden opportunity to bring a child and to be reminded ourselves of the awareness of the reality and the justness of God's final judgment. Right. I'm just going to say this very briefly because I'm, I'm out of time this is a great and central biblical teaching. Death and the judgment. The Bible teaches that all human beings are going to stand before God and they are going to give an account of their lives someday to Him. Hebrews 9.27 says, Just as it is appointed for man to die, after that comes the judgment. Now, I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about that, what the Hebrew writer is actually saying there. He's not, saying, he's not trying to convince us that we die. We know that. We don't need a verse on that, do we? He's just saying, just as it's appointed for man was to die, just as sure as you die, the point is, you will also be judged. Right. Just as certain as death is the judgment of God. Just as it is appointed for man was to die, after that comes the judgment. What a gift. What a gift for a child to grow up deeply convinced that the whole world will face God in the judgment someday. How sad it is that some kids grow up not knowing a thing about this. Mm -hmm. Knowing that there is a judgment, knowing that all humanity will appear there, knowing that we will give an account to a holy and just God, friend, that's what gives life its seriousness for a child and for all of us. What makes life so serious? What makes Sexual immorality and the decision about those things serious? What makes it serious about who you're going to marry and what kind of life you're going to live and what your religious beliefs are going to be? What makes all that so serious? Because life is short and eternity is certain. That's right. If our children grow up knowing these things that we're talking about, then they can... They can perceive the seriousness of life. Parents worry far too much, I'm afraid. Wendy and I did. We were way too much concerned about our children's happiness in life. What we should have worried about. I wish we could go back again. Randy and I both said this uh, the other night. Uh, if we could go back and do it again, probably our top priority would be to saturate our children with Jesus. And his teaching. To be less concerned about happy, happiness in life. Right. But my kids are grown. Yours may not be. Hell is a golden opportunity to bring children into the light of the reality of God's final judgment. And then here's the last thing. Hell shows us the extent that God was willing to go in order to save us from all of this. The fear of hell is a golden opportunity to help our children and to be reminded ourselves to understand the, the uh, cross of Jesus and the greatness of Christ. Why did Jesus speak so much about hell? We talked about that in the last lesson. Why did Jesus use such de descriptive terminology it is because he wanted us to see what he was paying for when he went to Calvary. <clears throat> when he died on the cross, in our place, on our behalf. Jesus wanted humanity to know 
I'm paying this debt for you. Amen. And in me, you can escape it. On the cross, Jesus' punishment, I mean, it, it scarcely describable. I mean, the bloodied, disfigured remnant of a man was given a cross that was perhaps, as some say, recycled, likely covered in the blood of other criminals, maybe even feces and urine from other men who had been previously hung on that cross, and then Jesus hung there in immense pain and slowly suffocated to death, and the worst part of it was how it affected his relationship with his own father. You can debate about that uh, if you want to, but there was a spiritual component to Jesus becoming the Lamb of God and taking our sins in His own body on the tree. Paying for our sins, it was as if though Jesus was taking hell into Himself to save us from it. And that's what our children need to know and understand. And when hell is the backdrop of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and Him purchasing the church with His own blood and the way of the Christian faith, when all of that is set against the backdrop of a holy God who will one day judge the world and condemn the wicked, friend, the gospel has, as Paul said, the power of God to save. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. You take away hell and you take away a certain amount of the power of the gospel. Don't you? <laughs> this is the key. This is the key. This is the absolute key to everything. The fear of hell is a golden opportunity to magnify the cross of Christ and the greatness of Christ and His sacrifice and the greatness of His love and the greatness of His mercy and the greatness of His patience and the greatness of His compassion and the greatness of His nearness and His friendship and the greatness of His tenderness toward us and the greatness of His power and authority over death and hell. What a golden moment for children to meet and to know the living Christ and the glories of what He has achieved for humanity at the cross. That's why Jesus is described at uh, His resurrection as being victorious. Amen. Having in His hands, according to John the Apostle, the keys of death and hell. And why He is described as the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last, the beginning and the end. The one who has all power and authority in heaven and on earth because he won a great victory for humanity at the cross. Amen. The remedy, let me tell you, going back to that original conversation I had with a couple of co-workers, the remedy, as I see it, for the fear of hell with our children is for us to be prepared to paint the achievements of Jesus and the cross in such lavish colors that it would outshine hell. In fact, I read a preacher's notes along these lines. He said that uh, he raised his uh, kids, teaching them about hell, being very clear on the penalty of sin and the result of a life of sin, how it ends in hell. And he also used that opportunity to teach them the gospel to teach them what Christ achieved for humanity at the cross. And he said, he said that he would go in to his children's room at night and uh, he, would, he would calm their fears about death and judgment and hell by singing this song to his children. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning and his precious blood's atonement. I then repented of my sins and gained the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me. With his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew all my life. He plunged me in victory beneath his cleansing blood. Beneath that cleansing flow of blood that he shed for us at Calvary. 
What is there that could calm our fears more and to give us confidence in the face of death and eternity than to know that we are in Him, that we are in Christ, that our transgressions have been blotted out, our sins have been cleansed, and our souls have been washed, and that even as we sin, even those of us who are Christians, as we sin, because of Him, we can repent. We can confess our sins and be forgiven of all of our sins as we strive to walk continually in the light. There's so much more to say about hell. I wish we had more time. Maybe we can come back to it again a little bit later. Let me ask you all. Let's end with a question. What should a preacher preach? When you take these things into consideration, what should a preacher preach? What should mothers and fathers teach? What should Christians teach as they evangelize the lost? Well, I believe that we should preach and teach that hell is real. Don't hide it. Don't try to avoid it. And don't be ashamed of it. The Lord didn't do any of those things. He was very bold in His proclamation about these things. We need to preach and teach that hell is terrible. That's unavoidable. Hell is terrible. It's awful. But we also need to teach that those who do not obey the gospel and are not faithful to obey Christ's teaching will spend eternity in hell. You know that first uh, Thessalonians or 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse where it says Jesus is coming in flaming fire to uh, bring vengeance upon those who do not obey the gospel. Now we take that to mean most of the time obey the gospel is to repent of one's sins, confess faith in Christ and be baptized. And that's certainly an aspect of obeying the gospel. But the gospel really is all of the teaching of Jesus and the apostles and the inspired prophets of the New Testament. Jesus is coming simply to disobey all, to punish all who disobey. This is why Christians need to be reminded that hell is still something to be concerned about. Most importantly, in expounding and applying biblical teaching on hell, we must emphasize that there is a way of salvation, and that is only in Jesus. And through obedience to the gospel and faithfulness to, to live according to his teaching and by being in Christ, we then have an unshakable hope. An unshakable hope that allows us to look forward to what is coming. I hope you can take these things in. I hope that you'll think about these things and you'll allow these things to motivate you, first of all, to do what God wants you to do. And then to share these things. I'm not saying that we should... We should Focus on hell, okay? I'm not saying that. We should focus on Christ. We just can't leave hell out of it. We just simply cannot. And if we do, the gospel loses its power. You may be here this morning, you're not a Christian. If that's the case, we'd like to invite you to come to Jesus this morning on His terms. Confess your faith in Him. Turn from your sins in repentance. Be baptized. Jesus said, you'll be saved. If we can help you with that while we stand together and sing, we invite you to come. Oh, the depth and the riches of God's saving grace.